for millennia, cities have been places where bright ideas spark. From the earliest riverside trading posts that turned into today's sprawling megacities in the digital global economy, cities can create positive experiences for people, always connected by technology. And when connected places work well, it's good for people and the planet. But making a connected place succeed is hard. There's loads of stakeholders, businesses, regulators, and community groups who want to be involved across every mode of transport, every type of building, the infrastructure that underpins them, and the data and digital platforms that connect them. All of this is needed to help people, communities, neighbourhoods and local businesses to prosper. Now, more than ever, we need our connected places to succeed. We are in a climate emergency. Rapid urbanisation means three quarters of us will be living in a city by 2050. And new technologies are revolutionising the way we live, the way we work, and the way we travel. Creating fantastic opportunities for innovation, jobs and growth. At Connected Places Catapult, we connect people, places and businesses for a future of sustainable growth and prosperity. We are the UK's innovation accelerator for cities, transport and place leadership. We are trusted across government, industry and academia. We bring cities together from across the world to connect new technologies, business models and investment opportunities. So join with us and be better connected for a future of sustainable growth and prosperity. Good afternoon and a warm welcome. I'm, I'm Rikesh Shah and I'm the head of the Innovation Procurement Empowerment Center. And I'm really excited by today's session, which is hosted by my colleague, Nick, Nick Talbot. And in particular, we have a fantastic set of guests working with Nick here this afternoon. We have colleagues from Barnet Council, Manchester City Council, and also Portsmouth Council. And they'll be sharing some of their case studies around this to critical topic around how do you create individual allies? How do you mobilize those individual allies? Because for innovation to work, hearts and minds and winning hearts and minds is essential. Because what we know in our separate organizations is we have our individual silos, you know, whether it's different ways to approach budget planning, whether it's different ways to approach prioritization, or it could be different cultures within separate organizations or also it could be a hierarchical challenge. So having a network where you can work together with your organization is critical. And this is particularly important when we think about innovation, because when we develop something innovative, it's, it's something new, it's different. And that means that we need our internal partners to help de-risk some of the challenges. We also need our partners to help us get future ready. Also, how do we bring procurement colleagues and legal colleagues in right at the beginning when you're working with something that's unusual and different? And if it's a technology solution, how do you start bringing in the systems alignment? So as you're planning something at the beginning, it aligns to the existing systems that you have within your organization. Before I hand over to Nick, there's a little bit more detail about the Innovation Procurement Empowerment Center, also known as IPEC. So IPEC, it is formed in the context of public procurement across the UK. We spend about 300 billion pounds and 70 billion of that is spent by local authorities. And what, you know, I don't have to sort of say anything that's new here is we have to deliver more for less. We have so many challenges, whether it's the climate emergency, whether it's challenges around delivering social care, housing, education, health, and so much more. So that pressure to deliver more for less has never been more prominent. But in parallel, we're seeing lots of technological advances. We're seeing a series of new areas like AI, robotics, machine learning, new materials, new processes. And it's just how do we leverage that to create new value? 
how do we leverage that to do things better, cheaper, quicker, greener, safer, etc. And as a result, in parallel, we're also seeing a new ecosystem. We're seeing different types of innovators. We're seeing startups, we're seeing scale-ups, we're seeing academic spin-outs, we're seeing large corporates that are now investing in open innovation, uh, R&D budgets. So we are seeing the wider ecosystem also changing. Uh, the, these are the people that could solve some of our problems. So it, in IPEC is funded through a government initiative. It's funded through Innovate UK. And primarily it's focusing on a series of things. It's focusing on creating practical tools. So how can we work with local authorities to provide advice around legal procurement, change management, scouting the market, and some of the other areas that will help enable uh, you to deliver successful innovation programs. We're also providing advocacy support. So as, as many of you will know, there's a new Procurement Act that's coming live this year. We've played quite a large role in, in lobbying and building advocacy with the politicians and many other key stakeholders to make sure that innovation through procurement is considered as a key enabler. We're also providing thought leadership. So if you have various case studies that you want to showcase and you want us to promote, please let us know, because we want to share that with the wider community. We're also providing academic rigor. So we're working very closely with the University of Birmingham and the University of Manchester. And we're very much focusing on how do we build evidence to say what's working, what's not, and where some of the gaps are, so we can use innovation more effectively through procurement. And finally, a bit like today, we're building communities. We want to continuously showcase some of the great things that are going on, which colleagues will talk about today, but also talk to each other about some of the challenges and perhaps some of the solutions that's helping to drive more innovation through your organizations and ultimately create more value. Finally, a couple of things I wanted to promote. Uh, please join our community on LinkedIn and visit our website. So it's ipec.org.uk. And finally, as you would have noticed, we're recording this webinar. So we'll be making it available in coming weeks. So please, please look out for it and promote it. Without further ado, I'm really excited to hand over to my colleague, Nick, Nick Talbot. Nick. Thanks very much, Rakesh. Uh, thank you, everyone, and welcome. And we'll flip through a slide. Yes, I'll start here, Kat. Thank you. So IPEC, uh, practically speaking, has been going since 2019, uh, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. We've been officially funded since 2022. And this being our third year, uh, our first online community event of 2024, uh, we're starting to grow a little bit in maturity and the community is growing uh, both digitally um, and in person. So we look forward to providing that full range of support that Rikesh says to many of you on this call potentially. Uh, I'd like to quickly come back to the key theme, which is uh, collaboration, and we particularly focused on the internal allies, so collaboration within your council authority. Now, throughout this um, event, we will drift a little bit because market engagement is really important. Collaboration between councils is really important. But what we're in effect trying to do is really be specific about council collaboration. Um, so next slide, please, Kat. So with that past experience that IPEC has had, a message that kept coming through in research, uh, round tables and our interactions, our deliveries, uh, is that collaboration is essential for innovation procurement. Rikesh made a really good point that if something is new, it probably doesn't fit the existing processes, hierarchies, uh, silos, budget structures, et cetera, et cetera. And so innovation procurement really requires collaboration to kind of progress it and embed it within councils. But then as a result of that, on the next slide, we'll see that the other part of this feedback is that collaboration is one of the biggest difficulties that authorities in the UK face. Um, again, something that we've heard time and time again, um, and it's something that we really wanted to try and address. I think that when we took a look across the market, at the professional training that's available uh, and various other ways that are available to councils to upskill. Uh, what we noticed on the next slide, Kat, is that in, in essence, there's a lack of practical advice 
uh, especially council specific advice in innovation procurement in general, but especially around collaboration. Everything's a little bit too conceptual when it comes to collaboration and stakeholder management. It's a bit too theoretical and it, it kind of falls apart when, when the road test is done and you run into all the uh, kind of personalities and, and difficulties along the way. So on the next slide, I just wanted to kind of highlight to everyone, uh, one of the things that we really want to do with this particular event is welcome people from a hugely wide range of backgrounds, professions, teams within councils. Uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the ones that we think uh, are important and we've kind of come across in our work through IPEC. Uh, service managers, so that could cover everything from housing to adult social care and many others uh, besides. Procurement commissioners and contracts. You've then got these core teams like finance and legal um, who have rep representation at board level. You've increasingly got councils with innovation teams and heads of innovation, uh, transformation, that kind of thing. You've also got data, um, research and insights, people who have key information to drive procurements, understand needs. We've got project managers key to collaboration, economic development, digital and IT, council leadership members and community engagement. Um, I think it, it really just this one slide alone does demonstrate that breadth and also kind of height around the hierarchy uh, that innovative procurement can span. Um, with that said, I'd like to move on to introducing our speakers today. Again, in the vein of really welcoming different professions and teams to this space uh, and kind of uh, practicing what we preach, that element of collaboration. We've got three speakers today, um, and Paul at Barnet will also be uh, joined by Rob, so in, in effect four. Um, with Barnet, we've got a really excellent case study around innovation procurement. Uh, I think it's a really well-rounded one and great inspiration for everyone on this call um, to see what great work looks like and the successes as a result about how internal collaboration is essential for resolving certain innovative procurement issues uh, and how market engagement can be key to removing internal collaboration doubts or resolving internal disagreements. Um, and we'll also come on to, as I said, those many benefits, including many unexpected ones. Um, but then uh, we didn't want to be all uh, unicorns and rainbows today. As I said, practical advice. We want to be uh, really kind of diving into the nitty gritty. Um, so we've got Peter from Manchester City Council. Uh, he'll be giving us a, a, a few tastes of a type of collaboration in a, in a particular area. And we'll be running into some of those barriers again that I mentioned. Uh, what I like about Peter's example, though, is that he'll help us understand what are those lessons learned and building up awareness of when collaboration may or may not be a uh, kind of good option. And then uh, also highlighting methods where more than one council is involved. And then when we come to Portsmouth City Council um, and Jane, um, again, an excellent example. And I think after we've scared you with uh, some of Peter's, uh, which does have a, a happy ending, uh, we'll still uh, in Portsmouth show you that there are actually some fairly easy opportunities available in almost any council to start collaborating. Um, and once you get that ball rolling, it will grow organically and you'll bring in different parties along the way, including uh, council leadership and political buy-in, and that can really add momentum to your efforts. Um, and we'll also touch on a few things such as local authorities um, that do great collaboration and achieve impact, uh, but often when it goes under the radar or doesn't enjoy the celebration that it deserves, that's definitely something that we want to change uh, through IPEC by championing and celebrating a lot of the excellent case studies we come across. Um, and then finally, again, this idea of Often innovation procurement can be a flash in the pan and you have a great project, but then what happens next? I think um, in all of these, uh, we show that that long-term to commitment to collaboration can bring long-term benefits. So again, we'll come back to some successes that Portsmouth experienced after their collaborative project ended. Um, with all of that said, uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, to the audience, we do have a Q&A function on this call. If you would like to chuck your questions um, for the three councils into the Q&A, then there will be time at the end of the event to open up and uh, for me to pass those questions on to the panel, to the speakers, um, the councils presenting today. 
And generally, we try to keep the event so that everybody can get the most out of it within the hour. Um, but we do have 90 minutes booked for this event. So if there are still questions uh, that need asking and answering, we can carry on uh, past the hour. But hopefully, we'll give you as much as possible by 3 o'clock. Cool. Kat, if we can move on to Barnett, and I will introduce Paul. Yes, Paul Bragg from- Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Excellent. And Paul will be talking to us about uh, their EV charging program. And Paul, not to big it up too much, but I have already said, I think it's a glowing example of uh, collaborative innovation procurement in many ways. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy for you to join us today. And, and thanks very much. And yeah, feel free to take it away. Okay, thanks for inviting me. Um, so Barnett's um, business case really has come about uh, due to Barnet being successful in securing £12 million of grant funding, which has helped us to fund four major EV charge point projects. Those grants have, have ranged from uh, supporting 75% of the project costs down to 50% of the project costs. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Kat. So hopefully what I'm going to uh, tell you in the, in the next few minutes, because we've not got very much time to get through this, but uh, hopefully I'll demonstrate the importance of market engagement. And also, cut on the next slide, please, um, that will also um, demonstrate that uh, there are actually different ways of doing things and we can convince our internal colleagues um, to, to go down a different route. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide, please, Kat. Thank you. Um, so really starting with with barriers um with all procurement in barnet and i'm sure it's no different to to most local authorities there will always be consultation and collaboration with internal colleagues in our case um we consulted with our legal teams particularly our contract experts uh, procurement team <coughs> and also finance team um however with ev projects it, it's quite a new market so it's something that was quite new to to all our colleagues and all those departments. So, um, you know, it, it, that was a challenge in itself to start with, because not surprisingly, um, when they hadn't experienced something previously, they had had a number of issues and concerns um, that they raised with us in the in the way we were planning to take the projects forward into procurement. Um, and I'll just give you an example of of some of them, not necessarily all of them, but the key ones were. Um, our proposed speed of procuring um, was very much down to the fact that we had um, secured grant funding and the grant funding conditions required us to procure pretty quickly. Um, you know, we had, to, we had to complete the projects in, in quite a tight timeline. So in order to do that, we'd identified that um, we needed to find a framework contract because we wouldn't have time to write all the documents ourselves for that procurement. Um, and we identified the best uh, one in our, our view was the Oxford DPS, which was a specialist EV um, route. Um, there were some worries raised that um, the model documents that uh, were available within our DPS wouldn't necessarily match the Barnett's usual approach to contracts. Um, we explained that the, uh, the model documents were just an example, um, the, the, the beauty of the Oxford approach is that it's flexible you can amend those documents in any way you you wish um, and so we were able to sit down with our, our lawyer um, our contract lawyer and, and work our way through the model documents and make the tweaks necessary for them to be comfortable that, that effectively we'd barnetize the uh, the documents so that we would end up for contract that everyone was happy with um, we also then had uh, the complexity of our, our requirements um, as we'd set out that we wanted bidders to give us four different financial models in replying to the to the tenders. Um, and the worry there was that that was quite complex and was going to involve quite a lot of work for the bidders and that might put them off and, and affect the number of bids that we would have received. Um, we also had concerns regarding the proposed length of contracts because um, we were proposing a 10 year length of contract for the lamppost solution contract. And then we had a non lamppost solution contract where we were proposing 15 years. 
that's not normal for Barney, and I'm sure it's not probably not normal for most local authorities. Um, certainly in the, the highways arena, eight years contracts are, are sort of the maximum. So we had to convince them that, that, that the need for that. Uh, and to help to tackle those last two concerns, um, what we did, we invited, uh, we, well, we, we, we decided we needed to do a soft market test. So therefore we invited the market into our office to identify our, appro uh, our approach or proposed approach and to ask them what their views were on that, what their preferences were, what would um, excite them about what we were proposing to make sure that they were going to be a bidder um, and also to get their feedback. Um, and, and what that did was that confirmed to us in the feedback that the contract lengths we were proposing were essential um, in order for the uh, contracts to be financially viable for them um, because payback on these types of contracts generally they advised were eight, seven to eight years. So any contract less than 10 years just wasn't going to be viable for them. Um, another concern related to the financial aspects of the, of the bid scoring uh, was that we actually wanted to score the financial aspects higher than the quality aspects. And that, again, not something that's normal in terms of the way procurement teams like this to be done. Usually they like the quality to be at least matched to the financials. Um, and it was also felt that the tender evaluations may favour the bidder, providing the best financial position. Um, so to overcome that concern, we uh, ensured that the quality submissions were evaluated before we even looked at the financials. Um, that way, the quality scores were, were baked in and there was, there was no uh, view that any of the financials could have affected those scores. Um, it, it's normal practice within Barnet, and I'm sure within most local authorities, that um, where it's recommended by officers that um, the council uh, invest in projects that a, a case that a business case needs to be put together in our case we take business cases to uh, a capital investment board for them to scrutinize um, so in, in order at, for us to ensure that the business case was going to be robust um, we felt the best way to do this was to collaborate with our finance team uh, and we recruited two finance officers to do the evaluation of the financial aspects of the contract. Um, and uh, essentially what that meant is that they, uh, they were endorsing our recommendation um, and because they work for finance and generally the Capital Investment Board is, is, is leading finance officers, we felt that they would have a little bit more confidence if it wasn't evaluated by us as officers, but actually by their own financial team. Um, so, you know, that's the way we got around some of those, those concerns. Um, I think that the, the successes that we got, if we could move on to the next slide, please, Kat. The success, successes we got out of, um, having that collaboration, both internally, but also by talking to the market through the soft market test was that there was no issues with the four different option uh, financial options we were proposing. They were happy to um, submit bids on that basis. So the extra work um, that was felt might put them off, that wasn't an issue. They were quite happy with that. Um, from that, um, we, we got the benefit of being able to uh, choose which option to go for. Um, and that varied depending on when we did the procurements as to when interest rates were high, um, it wasn't worth us investing was the outcome. When interest rates were low, it was worth us investing. So again, having those options to consider and based on the timings can affect the outcome. Um, we also obviously used the feedback from the soft market testing to give confidence to our colleagues uh, by addressing a lot of their concerns. And I think I'll stop there and come back to Nick. Hopefully I've not gone over time, Nick.
<laughs> no, perfect, Paul. Uh, and thank you. I think um, just for the audience's benefit, again, a recap of a, a couple of those points, certainly the ones I was picking out. Um, we mentioned them before as well. Um, we tried for this event to stay within the confines of mobilizing internal allies. But I think when it comes to authorities or teams uh, who are collaborating, um, they look at collaboration both internally, externally, with the market, with other councils. Um, so you will see that kind of broader sense of collaboration coming up. And I think two great examples uh, from Barnet. In the first case, uh, this is something, by the way, we see quite commonly, that grants, uh, they need to be spent quickly. Um, and sometimes they have constraints around spending on innovation. So that is a barrier to overcome. I love how you used collaboration with Oxford uh, to get those templates to speed yourself up. Um, and then the other form of external collaboration, reaching out to the market so that that uh, feedback or input, those, those facts and specifics could be fed internally to overcome some of those disputes or, or, or doubts uh, that different parties had internally. Um, but those are two forms of external collaboration. I think a really great form of internal collaboration, Paul, and uh, Rob, feel free to join in as well if you like, uh, was when you were talking about the financial model. So my understanding is that because this was an innovative procurement, a little bit different for Barnett, uh, it meant that you needed to come up with a new financial model. And also because you had that longer length of contract, et cetera, except multiple types of solutions and so on. Um, so Paul, if you could tell us a little bit more about what was it like uh, through that process of collaborating with legal, with finance? Um, and I think you you kind of talked a little bit about how the collaboration led to a more resilient model. Could you maybe walk us through a little bit more detail about what that collaboration looked like, felt like, uh, any kind of thoughts you have after the fact? Yeah, so sort of starting with the financial model, um, we, you know, the, the original concern about if, if you're asking the market to price effectively for different ways of delivering the financials of the contract, that that would put them off. Um, actually, you know, it proved to be really important because of the outcomes that we got, depending on the time when the, when we conducted the procurement. So, so the difference between the four options was using the grant funding plus either the council fully funding the balance or the uh, supplier fully funding the balance. And then there was a hybrid option in between, which was a sh potentially sharing the balance. So if it was a 60% funded by grant funding, leaving 40%, that hybrid was we shared 20% each. So there was a sort of partial investment from us and a partial investment from um, the provider. Our view on that was that, you know, if if we're all sharing in the investment, then we've all got a stake in it and therefore we're all going to want the same things out of it. We've got to make it successful because um, we're making an investment. We want to return on that investment. So we're, we're working more as a partnership to, to, to get successes out of it. Um, as it turned out, that's not the way we went on, on either of the two procurements that we did using that route. One of them, we ended up with um, us 100% investing after grant funding. And on the other one, um, it was 100% from the provider. Um, but as I say, the reason for that was that when we evaluated um, the finances, when interest rates are high and you have, have to, and we had to borrow money because we don't have um, several million pounds laying around in the council to invest, the uh, cost of that borrowing was not going to give us a very good return. So that sort of negated the benefits that we were going to get. Um, so that's that's the point when you say, right, okay, let's let's let we need this project to go ahead so the supplier can fund it to make sure the project can go ahead. Um, but on the other occasion when interest rates were low when we procured, it was definitely worth us investing because we were going to get a good return over the over the duration of the contract. Um, so it just shows that you know things can change, um, and you know you can get a better outcome if you uh, keep your options open um, by procuring in that in that manner. 
Yeah, I think, again, I'll say uh, it's an excellent example of where you got the perspective of legal finance yourselves and the market, and you kind of mixed all those perspectives so that you really covered all the bases and maybe uh, where people held assumptions or maybe were a little bit wide of the mark because it wasn't their expertise, that helped kind of come up to a nicely balanced and complete view on things. And you did kind of iterate and work through those different avenues. Um, I'd also like to ask about some of the successes, including the unexpected successes, uh, things that happened after the successful procurement. Uh, so I suppose one of, one of the things that... that shocked us quite a bit was on on our latest um tender that we obviously when you when you're requesting grant funding you you're having you're doing that or we did it before procurement so we had to make a number of assumptions in terms of what the projects were going to cost and how much grant funding we were asking for um with the latest one which was the lamppost solution um when the tenders came back they actually came back half of the cost that we had estimated um, and our estimate was effectively asking for money to allow us to roll out 500 charge points. Um, when we evaluated the prices significantly lower, we were able to go back to the grant funding source and say, um, are you funding a 500 charge point project or can we keep the money you've given us to be able to fund a 900 charge point project or thereabouts? Um, and luckily the grant funding source said, we're quite happy to, to give you the money you asked for in the first place. And if you can deliver more than 500 charge points, that's a win-win for all of us. So yeah, go ahead and do that. So, so that was, that was quite a surprise that uh, with all the concerns that we had internally that we might put off the market, um, that, you know, we ended up with an outcome that was far, far better than we, we had anticipated. Yeah, a great response from the market to the new model and, and your commitment in that space and successful procurements previously. Um, and there were other successes as well. You also had uh, some senior buy-in and, and recognition, and you also had some nominations for some awards. Uh, Rob or Paul, do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, either of those? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Rob come in for this one. Um, yeah, we've had a sort of a range of... Uh... A range of awards that have been nominated for now, uh, presumably looking at our procurements and our rollouts, um, using I mean a lot of the info that Paul has just just gone over. Um, it's also worth saying that you know within the most recent lamp column tender, part of the reason that we were able to to do that is because we we looked to do a call off approach with the the contract, so we were then able to scale it up. That then also allowed us to sort of merge some of those the approaches that we, we were speaking up before in terms of, of who puts the funding uh, in at different points. So if we're not able to secure grant funding in the future for those call-off options, then we can utilize fully funded models um, and sort of allows us to mix and match funding models on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, it just gives us that extra, extra flexibility that we, we knew we'd got grant funding to roll out the first year of the project uh, as I say, originally looking for 500, but it's going to end up probably being nearer to 900. But there's no guarantee that we're going to secure grant funding in the future. So moving into year two of the contract, we can switch to the fully funded uh, solution if we wanted. Um, so we've given ourselves you know, a fair bit of flexibility to be able to continue whether we've got funding or not. Yeah. Thank you both for presenting. And yes, uh, I think again, I'll uh, reiterate for everyone that I think it's a great example of collaboration in, in the broadest sense uh, with other councils and the market, but um, how important and integral that internal collaboration with legal and finance was to get to cracking the model, to getting the terms right, um, and, and the future successes that led to. Uh, Paul and Rob, I'll call you back in uh, a little bit later on for the panel, uh, but otherwise Kat, um, please, can we move to Manchester City Council and Peter? Yes, Peter, welcome. Hi, Nick, and everybody else. Thanks very much for inviting so, me along. 
Yes, of course. And uh, today, Peter, uh, again, we're throwing curveballs at you left and right in this event, but uh, Peter's going to be giving us a kind of a, a three tastes of uh, an approach uh, or, or a period of uh, procurements, innov innovation procurements he's attempted over the years. And uh, as I say, there is a, a happy ending, but yeah, plenty of barriers and learnings along the way. So we want to keep it real. And Peter, please take it away for us. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, so there's a picture there of a single wheelie bin parked in the street. Um, obviously, it's quite an old one because these days you have to have seven or eight of them, um, all different colours. But um, that's me, Peter Schofield, Head of Integrated Commissioning and Procurement in Manchester. I'm going to talk about um, some of my collaborative experiences, not all from Manchester, um, and, and there's a kind of a common thread amongst it. So um, learning from collaborative experiences now. <clears throat> The first one uh, relates to time that I spent uh, working in a, in, in, a, in a small authority in the Northeast, um, which was part of a two-tier system. If you could move on to the next slide, uh, it shows a, a picture of a, a, a lovely leafy lane. This was actually a street called Cooperative Terrace, which was in trimmed in, in County Durham, which was part of Tony Blair's constituency um, at the time. This this all happened, and, and, and he was Prime Minister at the time, but that's got nothing to do with the story. If you can move on to the next slide, please, a little bit of the kind of background here is that we worked in a two-tier system, so the County Council was the Waste Disposal Authority, and the District Councils were responsible for collecting waste, so they put the bins out and collected them, sorry, supplied the bins and collected them. And Corporative Terrace, um, aptly named, <clears throat> the centre line of the country was the district boundary between Sedgefield and Easington districts. Uh, so the bins and the grass on the east side were Easington bins and cut by Easington. And the, the bins and the grass on the west side were Sedgefield bins collected and the grass cut by Sedgefield Council on different days. Um, so there was a we had fairly regular discussions with, with our oppos in other districts and a decision was kind of, um, or, or an idea was floated that maybe um, we could we could harmonise some of this in the interests of efficiency, and it didn't just focus on one street. It was maybe two or three streets away. Um, you know, what if we um, crossed the line into Sedgefield and and cut some of their grass, and in return they'd pick up a few of the bins um, that were in in our district, add them to their routes, and it would be more efficient and more straightforward, and the residents would um, all get the service on the same day. Um, it failed. Um, wasn't a good idea, apparently. The insurers didn't like it. Um, couldn't have Easington council vehicles going around in Sedgefield doing stuff. Um, the lawyers didn't like it because if somebody had an accident, who would be to blame and who would who would have to take the, 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 the carry the can, um, who would pay compensation, etc. So there's just a basic undercurrent of people thinking about their own personal um, risks and so on above the actual cause, which which would have been to make things simpler and give people an easier life. Um, so um, it wasn't really a procurement failure because they were all in-house services that were being provided. But I think it just kind of shows how um, you can have a you can have a bright idea, but maybe all sorts of barriers that are erected in in, in your way. And um, shortly after that, I'm, I'm quite comfortable talking about this because shortly after that, both districts were abolished anyway, and it's all done by the county council now. In, in pretty much in the way that we suggested. So if you could move on to the next slide, please. And th this one relates to um, the time again in the Northeast when I, I was working for the Northeast Regional Improvement and Efficiency Partnership. So um, if you could move on to the next slide, this, this is about um, a range of, I, I was a program manager for the, the Northeast REAP and I looked after the Waste and Environment Program and and a highways one as well, and a climate change one. <clears throat> but within the Waste and Environment Program, there were eight different projects, um, total value of about four million quid. And the idea was to look for efficiencies through collaboration, and um, and, and 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 therefore get um, simpler, more effective ways of working, and uh, make reductions in, in in budgets at the same time. Um, one of the um, I think probably the most successful of, of the projects within that portfolio was, was, was one whereby we collaboratively procured route optimization software for refuse collection rounds. 
um, which entailed spending quite a lot of money on trackers in vehicles with all of the um, inherent objections that came from various people who didn't want trackers in the vehicles for some reason, um, and also putting technology in the cabs so that they, you could have maps on your dashboard, which we've all got now in our cars, but in those days, it was a pretty rare thing. And, and they all had to be linked to a regional um, system that uh, optimized the route. So basically, it was like a really, really sophisticated sat-nav. If you tell the way you wanted to go, which was basically collect the bin from outside every um, property in the district, and it would work out the best way of doing it. You could program various parameters. You could say, we want you to only do right turns. It would obviously take a lot longer, but it would it would work a way out to do that. Um, so in, 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 it was a pretty smart system. Um, each of the, the councils in the region, and by this time, the, the, the districts in Durham all were going through the process of being abolished. So it was 25 authorities to start off with, but it was going to be 12 by the time we'd finished. Um, and because the districts were harmonizing across the new counties, which are Durham and Northumberland, were harmonizing the refuse collection routes, it was possible to, to go across boundaries and to, um, to, to, to identify the most efficient routes. So um, we collaboratively procured the software so that we had a host authority, which was Newcastle City Council, who ran the procurement, bought the software, implemented it, and um, we, we, we found on average that um, where, where an authority had, where, where, where 10 routes existed, you could, you could usually cut that by one. Um, the routes that we were talking about would be um, approximately uh, a crew of six men, um, usually men anyway, and, uh, and, and, and one 130,000 pound vehicle. Um, and when you deployed them more efficiently using the route optimization software, you were able to cut that by around 10%. In some instances, it was more than that. Um, but basically what it meant was a freedom capacity so you could then implement the various recycling um, routes that were that, that were, were put in, in place. Um, what we did find, though, because we had a single portal, we had the the, 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 the data was all was all managed within one system. We were able to to run a few scenarios whereby, if you combine some of the larger districts within the the area, you could have made some really fantastic savings. You could have saved thirty percent, uh, not just fifteen. Uh, but the um, the idea of a refuse collection vehicle with Gateshead Council um, written on the side of it, collecting um, refuse in South Tyneside, uh, proves to be too much of a barrier for people to stomach. Um, so we 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 did well, but we could have done better. Um, if you could move on to the next one, please. We talk about um, some successful collaboration that's probably more procurement orientated. Um, again, a picture of a refuse, refuse collection vehicle. Everyone's going to take away from this that I'm obsessed with refuse collection. It's not the case, but um, the, 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 there's a common thread which I think tells the story. So if you could put the next slide up, please, that would be really useful. <coughs> okay, so within the when I, when I moved down to Manchester, I, I worked for initially the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities, um, which was ACMA, and um, managed the collaborative procurement hub. So the, the hub was set up um, with a, an objective to achieve 25 million pounds savings over a three year period with a diverse range of projects. Uh, and just to prove I'm not obsessed with refuse, it included things like HR functions such as recruitment, included ICT software, hardware, some construction schemes which set up the Northwest Construction Hub and various other um, regional frameworks for construction, um, consultancy services, some audit stuff, um, temporary staff, interim staff, elections printing and software, and, and, and many others. The program itself had uh, dedicated resources for the program, including myself at the time, and three procurement managers. Um, but we also had um, a, a fairly, well, a very keen um, benefits realization function within in the hub. And the people that did that would go and visit treasurers and say, okay, as a result of this, how much have you actually taken out of budgets? It wasn't just notional savings that you could possibly have made. It was, okay, we've put this system in place. We've put a new way of working in place. Um, how much have you actually saved? And that, that meant that when we said we'd saved 25 million, we actually had saved 25 million. In fact, it was more than that. But 
uh, we exceeded the targets. Um, but but the important thing about it was that the sponsorship of the program was was um, carried out at a very high level by one of the chief execs and um, the, the various people involved in the program, the ICT managers and so on, all had sub-regional groups that knew that um, that that the just that the program was happening, and also that um, there would be a very um, sophisticated way of identifying what savings were being made, which was also a fairly sophisticated way of finding out who was cooperating and who wasn't. Um, the way that we worked with the specialist vehicles and, 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 and the, the theme around refuse kind of comes in here is that you need to get certain people on side if you're going to make a, a, a specific project work. So specifically with the um, specialist vehicles, the fleet managers were very, very very averse to everybody saying, okay, well, let's all get the same vehicle because that would mean you might just need a few less service facilities. You might close a couple of garages down and they, their, their jobs may be at risk as a result of that. So uh, we let them away with the idea that, um, that, that that we would harmonize on one particular type of vehicle, but we, we set up a framework that had full flexibility that allowed them to specify the vehicles that they wanted. We talked to the suppliers and they all said that the price is the price and it doesn't matter whether you got the tender or you don't, they will tender the same price. So we ignored that. We, we set up a fully flexible framework that able, people were able to apply in the way that best suited their own operations. And guess what? The suppliers put in prices that were around 20, 30% lower than they would have charged if they just supplied you with a quotation over the phone. So um, the, 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 the framework was extremely successful. Um, when it came to renewing it uh, within a, a GM-wide basis, we spoke to the YPO, the Yorkshire Procurement Organization, who were considering setting up a similar framework at the time, and we let them take it, take it over and uh, continue it um, and, and, and include it within theirs because there was no point in running a, a parallel framework to them. So ultimately, the, the, the benefits were, um, were probably greater than they would have been. Uh, but one of the keys to this was having a chief executive who assembled a meeting every month and said, okay, what did we say we were going to do? What have we done? And who's involved and who isn't? So um, the next slide covers the lessons learned. And I think that it is that the appetite for change generally varies um, from place to place. You know, members have different views about what they'd like to see happen. Um, speaking, when I say members, I mean councillors. Uh, we also have the people that get involved in a program. Their, their attitude towards it may, may vary depending upon whether they're looking for promotion or whether they're looking to retire. Um, the quite, turkeys are more likely to vote for Christmas if, if they fancy the, the idea of, 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 of uh, no longer being around. Um, strong, strong leadership buy-in is absolutely essential. Um, that, if, if, if your leaders are bought into it, they'll give you the resources to deliver and they'll make sure that things happen and that um, any resistance is um, identified and and dealt with, and I don't mean by sacking people, but the um, the phrase "resistance is futile" became quite a, a, a well rehearsed phrase, and it was basically, if you're not doing it, and everybody else isn't they getting the benefits, then um, you can have some questions to answer about that. So um, understand what you're doing before you seek to be understood. That's a Stephen Covey. Um, phrase for those of you that might recognize it. The first example, legal insurance, political reluctance was overwhelming. It seemed like the right thing to do, but there were too many barriers. The second one, once we understood the boundaries stayed within them, as I said, we could have gone further, um, but it was uh, a question of knowing how far you could push and what you could achieve. And then the final one, results speak for themselves. People will get involved with the see There's something in it for others. And if a formidable chief exec is, is very helpful in those circumstances so absolutely uh, thanks very much peter um i think uh yeah there's there's quite a lot of details there and uh quite a few lessons learned um i will save uh one of the questions for later on uh when we move to the panel q a um but just quickly um just revisiting those barriers and tips uh for me peter it was interesting that um you had to kind of 
learn and and if you didn't have that longer term investment in trying to collaborate you could have just given up at the first hurdle so i think that's really important for everyone in the audience to catch and, and try and encourage that kind of attitude and culture um but just one quick thing uh quick question so we can keep moving along uh, nicely on time just revisiting uh the kind of legal and insurance problems that really derailed uh, the first one, I think, uh, first of all, they were quite technical things, maybe things you couldn't have predicted. But I wonder, in hindsight, uh, do you have any tips for how you would go back in order to overcome them? Or do you have any tips for how you would be more sensitive and pick up on it sooner and, and know to kind of change course and maybe go down a different avenue? Yeah, I think I think that's the nail on the head, to be honest. Um, you know, it, it, it seemed like an obvious thing to do. Um, and and the managers actually could have, you know, the actual the, 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 the foreman on the ground could have just arranged it in terms of certainly in terms of grass cutting on each other's patches. But if something had gone wrong, you know, you, you kind of you, you, you need to look at the risks. And and I think probably at the time we were a little bit gung ho about getting on with it and 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 ignoring the risks. And there is something about analysing the risks, what could possibly go wrong, and making sure that you design your project to take account of those risks and to mitigate them as much as possible. And actually, if we were using it in a procurement context, you'd probably take those risks and you'd ask potential suppliers what they would do to mitigate them and score their proposals on the basis of that. So um, I, I guess since those days, I've, I've taken a far more, um, not risk-averse, but risk-aware approach to, to what you do, identifying what could possibly go wrong and talking to people about getting their views on it as well, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know and then finding a way to, 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 to plot through, to plot through that. And sometimes that might just lead you to understand that it actually isn't worth it. And other times it might lead you to understand that it really, really is. Yeah, I definitely think that uh, if we're adopting this long term approach to collaboration, I say we're because I've spent 10 years on and off working in and with local authorities uh, myself. But if we take this longer term view of collaboration, then I think it's really important um, to kind of uh, understand that the skills we need and the experience we need, we have to build it up over time. And when it comes to risks, uh, we heard it with Barnett, we heard it with you. There are expected risks and then there are actual risks and how you get to the nub of it, whether it's expected or actual, collaboration is a huge part of that because you go straight to the horse's mouth, the specialist, whoever it is, and hopefully they can ground it out. Um, but yeah, I think that there is this kind of um, realism that, that there is the need for a longer term view if you are going to be serious about collaborating internally within a council or otherwise. Thank you, Peter. Um, we will come back again, uh, invite you back to the panel, um, but I will move swiftly on to Jane. Perfect. There's Jane. Hello. Excellent. Hi, Jane. Hi. Thank you. Um, so for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you will notice that I am head of economic development and skills, and there's not necessarily so much procurement that goes on in that sector. But I think what it really represents for us and Portsmouth's journey is that real cross-council approach that we've taken to procurement and particularly social value in procurement. And that hasn't necessarily been the easiest and most straightforward journey. And certainly I can really identify with the experiences of colleagues colleagues previously that have spoken about that really positive learning that they've had and those kind of learning and engagement points as we go forward. So yeah, let me tell you. Jane, uh, just before, we'll keep everyone uh, on the edges of their seats, just before we go into the case study, I'd like to quickly say that uh, just for the purposes of the, the flow of the speakers, uh, we maybe elevated you to the success case, multiple award nominations with Barnett, collaboration, excellent collaboration internal within the council, but also with other councils and externally with the market. We then maybe brought everyone back to ground with some harsh realities through Manchester, but proved that successes are still possible. Um, with uh, your example, Jane, what we're really trying to do is help the audience understand 
if one's exciting and one's grounding, there is a, a an easy option sometimes, a, a door cr uh, that's cracked open, I think, um, and someone inviting you in. So I think uh, it's important to say that um, in the context of the other speakers, this might be the most immediately practical approach. It's an organic one. It started small and grew. Um, and, and that's why I'm uh, very happy to, for you to present. With that, Jane, sorry for... Uh, pressing pause, but yes, please take us away. Portsmouth City Council and your uh, journey of building a collaborative relationship internally. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me share our story, which we have been fortunate enough to um, win an award for, but for us is very much a project that isn't ended. So whilst there's a lot of reflection, it's all part of the ongoing journey, which sounds dangerously like X Factor to me, but um, forgive me for that sort of anomaly. Um, as with all good stories, this starts uh, with a coffee. Um, and I think that's an important part of those, those relationships. Um, in terms of how we build it. So when I joined Portsmouth as a local authority and we we're a unitary authority back in 2019, I was responsible for our employment and skills, um, which ultimately included um, employment and skills plans as part of our planning section 106 work. And I already had a background in corporate social responsibility, as well as education and really saw the benefits of using that sort of work um, in any business environment. So I kind of came in with that viewpoint and that kind of subtext to the things that I was doing. And what I instantly recognised with a unitary authority like Portsmouth, and we're not enormous, but obviously there's a lot of complexities across um, across us as a local authority, was there was some really amazing things, some real commitment to apprenticeships in different directorates, some pockets of absolutely outstanding work that was really delivering social value, but no real framework for us to kind of do so it started by certainly for me just by the very nature of my role which is was then and is now relatively unique and it's quite difficult to have peers so you instantly search out those people that have that similar cross-council role um, and start to connect with people to as much as anything else for peer support but also to find peers who have similar agendas and how you can support each other and certainly connecting with people like our strategy team was really supportive in my general work, but also really identified some of the core values that we have as a local authority and how we're trying to approach stuff. And that kind of gave us some common ground from which to have our discussions. And I think um, perhaps my greatest skill um, is I'm not afraid to ask those stupid questions. Um, so as I started to explore what corporate social responsibility men and started to understand the language of things like social value I started to ask those stupid questions and it led me to have a coffee with one of our our deputy procurement manager now who fortunately is now our assistant director for procurement and didn't find so much an open door as a bit of a hug when we really found that we were kind of coming at it from the same place and wanted to achieve the same things and could instantly see those opportunities. And that personal connection was a big starting point for us as we started to plan how we could turn some of this work, working with our lovely corporate services strategy team on how we could unblock some things and turn what is some really great pockets of work into something bigger and stronger and give it more direction. And obviously around this time, they were starting to talk about PPN6 and legislation that was going to come in around procurement, things that we were seeing already starting to be considered at, um, at government level and that would have implications at local government level as time moved on and that was a useful tool for us to kind of um, promote and engender change in what we were doing and once we had that kind of basic idea with a few cross-council peers very very engaged with our lovely procurement colleagues we looked at where we needed to get buy-in and we looked at our portfolio holders and being led by very different portfolio holders we made quite a strategic decision as to which portfolio holder we started with and once we'd 
got one of our lovely politicians engaged, then the enthusiasm really run because, again, this was something that he personally was really engaged with. He wanted to drive and he set us some really strong targets. Now, I would have to say some of them we kind of went no with. You know, we didn't want to produce... Um, a system that replicated what other local authorities did. I think our colleagues from Barnet referred to Barnetizing things. And actually we wanted to do it the Portsmouth way because we wanted to make it work very much for a local way. And fortunately we had that political sport to keep that going. And he's continued to be a champion even when as we've moved forward, he hasn't been the portfolio holder that's been in charge and leading for us. And that's been very helpful as we start to slowly engage with different people. As we began to sort of unblock some of those communication barriers through that senior leadership engagement, we also then sought to have a director and our political leadership was very helpful at again picking a director from a different directorate than the key players, which was a really helpful experience because once again, it spread it further across the council and again, it's really easy to bring people on board with social value because we work for local authorities and people want to have positive impact. And it's a really nice opportunity to do that. And by bringing those cross organisational people together, what we had a real focus on was celebrating in each area and celebrating all of those little things. At times as we were doing things, we might delay things while we waited for certain other issues to go in place. I certainly remember a period where we waited for a key manager to retire because we knew that he wasn't going to be as on board with that forward thinking agenda. So it was easy to focus on other things and then come back to it to make more significant changes. And by doing that, we took out any possibility of there being any villains and really focused on solutions and positive change throughout everything that we're doing and particularly connecting with internal allies that really wanted that change. So with a director in place, we then focused on working through and engaging our CEO, working through directors and then working through their individual senior leadership teams to help them understand where it sat and the important responsibility of that, how it influenced the work that each individual teams were doing with procurement and trying to get that top down messaging of how important the main project which started for us in creating and implementing a social value, value policy was. But again, can't stress enough of the importance of celebrating the small victories and celebrating in every different situation so that all of our directorates and we have eight really understood what we were doing and we managed to implement our social value policy and start to really apply that with a very careful manner really recognizing that sometimes we can't apply exactly the same measures. So I'm aware of national models within social value that will give a particular percentage towards um, social value within a procurement exercise. We don't have a blanket approach. We have a sensible review. And what we found within that is we've had some real strong social value gains through our supply chain at appropriate places, but also taken out the pain for our contract managers in multiple positions across the local authority where those social value gains are more um, challenging. And that work and that collaborative piece across the council led us to um, be awarded the 2023 Public Sector Transformation Gold Award for social value in procurement, something that we're extraordinarily proud of um, because it reflected our real cross-council um, approach to work. Getting the social value policy in place, though, was just step one and almost started the work. And that implementation and the continued briefing of directors and our CEO, and as those roles and people changed and as key staff changed, keeping them engaged and updated is an absolutely key part, that communication so we continue to focus on that in a very regular way so that it never slips. That whole um, 
celebration piece is so important and that's led us to have a variety of events that have been focused on moving this piece of procurement work forward we've had social value conferences working on pretty much zero budgets as colleagues will very much be used to to celebrate the work internally We've worked with external partners and particularly our voluntary and community sector to set up frameworks in which we can promote the best impact for, for the city and for our local people. We've done that connection piece, which has been so important. We've engaged partners. And this year we won't do a big event because we're focused on a supply chain event that is focusing on a very specific subject. So for us, that's learning disabilities and employment and how we can make that work for some of our supply chain. And we have lots of successes within the local authority as to what we've done. And we're really trying to be part of leading by example so that it isn't just us dictating or suggesting what other people do, that we can also celebrate the incredible things that we're doing, often very small scale in the local authority, to show that we are putting our money where our mouth is. The... Um, Supported employment piece is something that we've worked on for a while. We have our own um, internal cafe, which we've managed to start up again after having a not very cost effective offer that died during COVID by working with a, a learning disability charity locally and offering a whole um, range of supported employment opportunities. Again, supporting key agendas across the local authority, as well as delivering some really important social value. This next year is about more challenge and more change. You know, we haven't finished the project because the project is never ending, but we certainly reflect constantly about the things that go forward. We're lucky enough to have finally appointed a business partner for contract management who's going to be really key in helping to unpick some of those remaining barriers about engaging contract managers who are working across multiple disciplines to help them understand the importance of social value and the work that they're doing within it so that they can really see it and feel it and we take lots of smaller steps forward. We continue with a steering group that looks at this work on a fortnightly basis. We have a very short meeting. Sometimes it's 15 minutes, sometimes it's closer to an hour. But we continue to move that core group forward, continue to be led by a director who's really passionate about it. And we continue to send out that communication and messaging because that celebration of the small things as we move everything forward is really important. And sometimes we'll focus on particular um, projects or agendas. And sometimes it's about generally how we can put things together and make sure that the reporting remains smooth. And some of those practical procurement pieces are moving forward and doing it. And our big lesson with everything is about celebrating at each point um, and for each directorate so that what we have is a shared ownership across the local authority and everyone seeing them play their part. I do think um, it it was delight, delightful to pick up um, our award in 2023. Um, but I think some of us felt quite guilty because it's difficult to necessarily recognise your business as usual as innovation. But what we have done is created a really positive culture that's moving forward and taking in more and more people across the council as we go. And that celebration of positivity and that collaboration both through our politicians through our senior leadership and all the way through our directorates is absolutely part of our key learning while also continuing to be our biggest challenge as we move forward with this thank you great thanks very much jane um, I see we've ticked just past the hour mark, so uh, thank you everyone who's uh, been a part of the event. I will ask Jane a couple of questions, then we'll open it up to the panel and some more questions there. If you do have to leave, thank you though. Jane, um, I think that I mentioned earlier uh, about throwing curveballs in this session and yeah, that collaboration is kind of, once you've got a taste of it, it takes you in all these different directions. Um, but I think what I really loved about the case study you shared was was that organic uh, element to it. And I think 
whilst IPEC as a as a program as a movement um we are very focused on procurement contracts and getting innovation actually happening in practice and deployed. Uh, sometimes the journey towards getting to that, sometimes you need to put some policy in place first. Sometimes you need to kind of look at your collaboration culture internally and make some improvements or, or, or some introductions there. And then you can move on to things like procurement. So I love that um, it was a very natural and, and kind of organic process you went through, obviously successful with the award. Congratulations on that. Successful in terms of senior buy-in, um, successful in terms of it being a harmonious process, uh, and then further kind of successes afterwards. And that's where I wanted to pick up on the, the kind of question for you specifically, was that with these uh, successes that you had throughout the collaboration, um, I said before, sometimes innovation procurement can be a flash in the pan um, and then nothing really happens afterwards. But when we were speaking uh, earlier about this case study, something that kind of came across was, and this maybe takes us full circle, that Barnett reached out to get market engagement to help with the internal collaboration. But what I love about your example, Jane, is that that efficient and effective internal collaboration actually helped you with external collaboration. So you could you tell us a little bit about that kind of uh, success that came afterwards and the legacy of that successful collaboration? I mean, I think um, colleagues have spoken about uh, different um, successes and partnerships. I think we really looked, you know, we all work for local authorities. So by our very nature, there is some amazing stuff going on. And we basically went out and found the people that were really willing and enthusiastic and positive, And we maximized what they were doing. And I think... Um, I think it was my colleague from Manchester who said, you know, there was no great threats, but there was a bit of look at these people and all the great successes and benefits they're having and the celebrations we're doing around their work. So, for example, our wonderful housing colleagues and the way they do their um, their building projects and the community engagement piece that you do around them, we really positively celebrated that work so that we were going more with the carrot rather than the stick approach to further engagement. And, you know, for the most part, and we all know we have different colleagues with different things, people want to be part of that positive journey. And it was about finding all of those open doors. And as I said, there were surprisingly more than you might imagine. And I'm not saying that everyone was that that easy because a lot of colleagues were incredibly stressed, unable to necessarily engage right at the beginning because of their own workloads. We all understand the environment in which we're working, where we are expected to do more for less. And there are financial strains and projects become more and more. But when they start to see the benefits of working positively with procurement and looking at social value and how you can get wider benefits both internally and for residents it became a really easy sell and I guess what we do as a as a group is really try to continue to sell those really positive examples and the efficiencies that we can make with no cost because we are all working on diminishing budgets, so achieving things with minimum effort and work is always the challenge. Certainly for us, whilst we'll celebrate this great work and we'll talk about it, we all still do it as an aside on our work. We're very excited to be joined by Abigail, who is our business partner for contract management. And I think she'll really help us to step forward but that resource is really just about a different redeployment of the way that procurement have dealt with a very sort of significant um, cuts they've had and making it work as best they can to be most efficient. It's about embedding social value in the procurement piece into everyone's job roles to just kind of try and achieve miracles with very little money you know, it would be easy for me to sit here and tell you about the challenges and how much easier it would be if people would give us an unlimited budget. But it's about being realistic about what we're facing in the environments we're working in and achieving the most through that. Yeah, um, at the beginning, we said one of those uh, essential aspects of feedback uh, from 
the variety of authorities that we'd engaged with previously was that collaboration is essential for innovation procurement because we have to break out of existing processes, design new financial models in the case of Barnet, uh, new job titles or, or, or kind of responsibilities and so on. Um, but I think that there are many other benefits to collaboration behind it. Uh, aside from it being a, a must do because it's essential for innovation procurement, there's a whole raft of other benefits. And you covered quite a few there, Jane. I think uh, being more efficient in working uh, together better, I think making better decisions because everyone's more informed and ultimately de-risking. I think de-risking is a huge one with innovation procurement and good collaboration is a great way of de-risking procurements. I think with that, I'd like to invite everyone uh, to come back on camera <clears throat> to join the panel. Great, I can see everyone coming along, that's great. Um, and whilst I sort through the questions, I think the one I'd like to ask to kick us off is uh, to anyone on the panel, having heard the case studies uh, from your peers, does anyone have any immediate reflections, thoughts, uh, anything like that that they'd like to contribute at this time? Shall I just jump in because no one got there first and just say that although we're all coming from really different perspectives and potentially very different job roles, I think the learning is very similar and very shared and it is about being really solution based for whatever project you're focusing, but also about trying to maximise the benefit of those internal and external relationships and perform you know, that more for less agenda that, let's face it, drives us all. I think our learning is very similar and certainly things that Paul and Peter were saying earlier really feel shared with the experience that we had in Portsmouth. Peter, were you going to say something there? Uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't desperate to dive in because um, the, the, there's, the, there's so many things that we've talked about um, without really going into huge depth, but... Uh, I certainly feel um, that Paul's, Paul's made a really good um, fist of doing something that's grant-funded and the the challenges that, that, that grant-funding regimes give us in terms of trying to get the best outcomes from a procurement are pretty well documented. We, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get an opportunity to bid for something. If you're in an organisation like Manchester City Council and you've got a good... Um, grasp of your data and a good understanding of what's needed and a lot of projects there um, almost oven ready um, then then you can you can put in a really good grant funding application and then it gets to procurement when when they bring it home and they say okay we've got a, this is November we've got um, to get somebody in place to deliver this project and they've got to have started by next March um, it, it presents you with a challenge to get the procurement over the line. You've got to be creative. You've got to be innovative. Um, and then the, 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 the dangers are often that when auditors look at it at the end and say, well, you didn't do a proper procurement. We're not sure you spent this money wisely. Um, you know, so so there's the, the, the kind of the need to be agile, the need to have been through that before and understand what could, what questions you could be asked afterwards um, is, is always there. But the opportunity to wrestle social value out of it is really really difficult then if if you want your supplier to provide you with um job opportunities for people within the area that that might benefit from from working with them it's very difficult to mobilize that in the time that it's that's, that's taken to to spend grant funding so you know having a good good long run at things and being able to understand what the opportunities are and take advantage of them doesn't necessarily always um present itself if, if you're up against it Time-wise, um, I think it's kind of important that we, we're innovative and we congratulate ourselves on on getting the project home. Um, but you know, given a given a better run at it, we could do we could do a lot more. Thanks, and Paul, Rob, any reflections or thoughts on on uh, the other case studies you've had today? I yeah, so I, I think go on, Rob. You go. I was going to say, I, just, I was going to echo what's, what's just been said, but I think they all sort of show um, sort of the importance of, of what you can get from innovation, whether that be income or savings, um, particularly sort of in the, the current landscape where we've all got sort of budgetary difficulties and, and financial constraints. It shows the, 
the potential benefits that can be brought from that innovation and collaboration. And I think it is very easy to work in a silo and think that um, you're doing the right thing. But as soon as you start widening and talking to other people internally and externally in our case, um, you know, you, you can get a slightly different perspective and realise that maybe you can do things slightly differently and get better outcomes from from making those changes and, and tweaks. Um, so, yeah, I think I think the more people you talk to and test your ideas, um, the more you're likely to come come up with the best solutions. Yeah, thanks everyone for uh, those. I think all spot on. Um, a question for Peter is, uh, or, or any of the panel, I suppose as well. Um, it's been great hearing about the case studies. Are there any active innovation procurement uh, examples you have on the go at the moment where collaboration plays a part? I think, Peter, you've probably got one uh, along those lines. So maybe you can kick us off and Paul, Rob and Jane, rack your brains. <laughs> There's probably a lot going on at the moment. But yeah, Peter, kick us off. Yeah, it's probably um, you know picking up from where I left off in relation to the AGMA um, collaborations. We now have GMCA, the Creative Manchester Combined Authority, that have taken on that facilitative role for um, collaborative projects and, and, and innovative projects across across the GM districts. And not everybody can always participate in these, but usually you can get five or six authorities that have all got a common problem. And the, the one one of the ones that we're looking at at the moment is what we're calling the, the Mega Vendors um, project, which is looking at the, the huge ICT system providers and who, who um, largely um, we are dependent upon um, you know the, the, you, you, you bring a small system in and you start using it and it grows and it grows and it becomes something that you can't get rid of um, easily and quite often these companies have become so powerful that if, they, if it, another company sets up to challenge them they buy them out and shut them down or they take whatever innovation they've got and make the product better um, now, I, I'm, I'm, that's a kind of a really high-level anecdotal kind of um, way of putting it. There's a lot more to it than that. But we are collectively, we, we all have issues we are, with, with the prices and the fact that one, one software house will charge two adjacent authorities with very similar requirements, massively different amounts of money. Um, and, and, you know, they'll, 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 they'll have different functionality and so on. So it's, it's a really complex area to grasp. Um, most people have signed non-disclosure agreements that says they won't tell anybody else what they're paying for stuff as well, which uh, which can get in the way of collaboration. But um, we, we've taken a couple of, 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 of these organizations, not not taken them on, but we've, we've, we've sat down with them and said, okay, let's see what we can do. And they've said, do you know what, if you, if you didn't do this in this particular way, it would make our lives easier and we'd save a load of money and we ha wouldn't have to spend a lot of the stuff that we do because of what you're asking us to do. Why do you want us to do it? And when you unpick it, you realize that there are ways that you can change the way you work and engage and, 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 and bring efficiencies in that, that will um, resolve some of those th th those difficulties. But you can only do it by having the conversation. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're thinking, okay, this isn't about saying, right, if everybody puts the, you know, the signature on a combined contract, we're going to get a better deal because there's more purchasing power amongst those organizations, there's actually a far, far more powerful um, potential for, for, for improvements by just sitting down and talking about it and saying, we've all got a common problem. Let's do, see what we can do to either bring the price down or to get more functionality for our money. So, so we are looking at this, as we're calling it mega vendors, but uh, it's, I think everybody's probably sitting and thinking, yeah, I can think of a couple of the, the providers that we're talking about. It's the, the capitas, the civic is the, 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 you know, the, the, large software houses, I'll, I'll mention Liquid Logic as well, one of them. But, uh, you know, they, they are all, um, they, we probably give them problems that they have to solve, that if we talk to them in a different way, they wouldn't necessarily have to do that and go to some expense. So let's, 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 let's approach it innovatively. You know, it's, it, it is innovative. Um, it, it's innovation that we're buying, it's creativity we're buying, but we're not doing it in a particularly innovative way. Thanks. Um, Paul, Rob and Jane, uh, are there any other ones you've got on the go at the moment or do you have plans or thoughts for what the next innovation procurement collaboration could be? Uh, no worries if you want to keep things under wraps. 
Um, but yeah, if you are happy to share even just a teaser, I think it might help um, as regards this particular question. Uh, we're actually in the process of um, about to launch another procurement for, for charge points. Um, this one's been done slightly differently again in that we're uh, collaborating with other London boroughs. So there's a, a group of four of us in the consortium. Um, and that's really to get uh, to, to look at how to get uh, best economies of scale and, and sort of the best um, price for also revenue generation for, for the authority. Um, so obviously that comes with its own challenges, trying to um, uniform the, uh, the different legal requirements, different contract requirements, et cetera. Um, but we're sort of still working through them at the moment. So I can maybe give a better answer in a few months time. Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, again, it's just uh, one of those points where um, based on the success, can we embed and kind of scale? And you even use the word scale there, I suppose. But but what happens is, is it a case where we have a good project and uh, there's some celebrating, but it doesn't go anywhere? I think in general, all of you today have kind of shared uh, those examples where it has led on to uh, bigger and better things very directly in that case, Rob. Uh, Jane, did you have something? Well, I, I was just going to comment that I think I'd be doing my procurement colleagues a disservice if I didn't say that every contract that goes out to procurement now is looked at in terms of what can be achieved. And clearly, for some, they need to go out on a very traditional basis and that's it. But I've certainly I'm aware of examples of different supply chain engagement to focus on particular aspects of the contract delivery or particular focus. I'm aware that we go through different adjustments on how we wait within contracts, within the very specific requirements that clearly they're working to and trying to do more and more of that internal and external collaboration to focus on best value for the council, but recognizing that that isn't necessarily cheapest it's about looking at best value a little bit differently and taking into account that really changing environment. And we're certainly at the stage where that's applied to as many procurement exercises as possible, not because we're perfect and we've got it all right, but because we've seen great achievements from the bits that we've done. And we're starting to see some of our much bigger contracts come into play with that and going through that process, which just increases the opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Jane. And again, wonderful to hear. Uh, we are coming close to time. And in the spirit of it being 2024 and uh, me getting increasingly into podcasts, one of the podcasts I enjoy uh, asks the question that if you could go back in time to when you started this innovation procurement journey and you could give yourself one tip or, or one nudge that you think would uh, kind of plant the seed and help you along this journey immensely uh, what tip would that be and I think if we go through uh, just in order of the speakers so start with Paul and Rob uh, move to Peter and then we'll finish with Jane uh, and then we'll wrap up there but Paul or Rob what would be that one nugget that you give to yourself if you had a time machine and you could go back to the start of the journey again well yeah. um I think probably um, not not to make too many assumptions. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's very easy for you to assume that your approach is potentially the right one. But, um, you know, to test that. Um, and, you know, we've certainly proved to ourselves that um, speaking to the market as well as speaking to people internally has helped us resolve our our issues. So I think we'd probably do a lot more of that going forward. Um, find the right people to talk to, to help us to resolve our, our issues. Yeah, I mean, mine was fairly similar to that. It was just to consult as early as possible, really, whether that be with the market or residents or internal stakeholders, um, just to get the people in the room to um, have a sort of diverse voices, really, and thrash it out in that way. Great. Thank you. Peter. Um, it, it, that is a, that's a great question. Um, and, and it's easy to, to kind of to say, yeah, that, yeah, what they said. Uh, but, but really, it is important to, to listen. Um, I, I put in one of the slides, uh, the Stephen Covey 
seek first to understand and then to be understood. And, and, and there's a lot of that in what they've said. You know, don't go thinking you've got all of the right answers and get frustrated and annoyed if people don't agree with you. You've got to kind of see it from their point of view and, and, and get it an understanding of what their requirements actually are. And, and there are, are other ways of doing things. Um, the bit of advice I always give people with, if they ask for it is, um, I'd rather I'd rather regret something I've done than regret something I've not done. But um, that doesn't fit in this context. <laughs> you've got to be really, you know, kind of, you've got to be measured about what you do and it takes time to learn that. Absolutely, no, pro no problems uh, echoing good advice. And Jane? I mean, yeah, the temptation to say what they said is really strong, but I guess mine would be to, to do it now because the earlier you start the conversations about a whole piece of work, about um, individual projects, the more notice you give yourself, the more you can achieve. But don't assume the doors are, are shut to you because we have found so many of them have been really, really positive internally and externally and, you know, just keep talking. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for sharing your case studies uh, and a, a number of questions we've asked along the way. Um, I think that this event has achieved so many insights and uh, talking points and um, it's been uh, brilliant to have you all together uh, and have so much come through in just one session. Um, so a big thank you again to all of you. I would also point you to any questions that didn't get answered or any questions you might have after this event. We have an IPEC space on LinkedIn um, and we will have various other forums throughout this year, uh, community events and the like for you to participate in, uh, send those questions through or ask them. And finally, uh, just to reiterate something I said earlier, which was, um, again, uh, a lot of the support that we provide uh, as Connected Places Catapult through IPEC uh, is fully funded. And that means that we really want to steer from you on what are your pain points. This is a perfect uh, case where um, everyone uh, we spoke to, all the authorities were flagging how collaboration is difficult. We need more practical advice around collaboration. Uh, and I think that we've really fully delivered with this event. So I would encourage you in the email that you receive after this event to let us know whether it's through the sentiment analysis or the event feedback process, uh, however you want to do it, or through the socials, uh, please let us know uh, what's difficult for you, what help do you need, or, or what did you find useful? Uh, that really helps us. Otherwise, again, a big thank you to the speakers and to you, the audience, for attending. Uh, thank you, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>